Hello, we have Andrew Antrenig, Corvin, Daniel Han, Dion, Goran, and myself, Michael. And I would love to touch on API interfacing briefly. It's been a hot topic over on the jail calls where Antrenig, who is present, has produced both a Lua front end for jail and an Elixir front end, and is looking at a, a was it Zig front end? And I- Zig and Oberon. And Oberon, okay. So that should be easy, and it partly is probably a question of documentation. So Antrenig, I would love to hear your experiences. Yes, uh, the TLDR version of this is that the jail um, subsystem is made of two parts. One of them is the jail param library, uh, which uh, has higher level uh, C functions that can be used by other things. For example, we use it with Oberon and Elixir, uh, where you can have when you where you can um, do the creation of the jail. Uh, however, there's also the second part, which is the jail system call itself, made of jail attach and other things that you can use. So you can fork a function and uh, for, sorry, fork a process that goes into a jail and then you can do whatever you want in it. So as a POC, now we have an Oberon uh, uh, program that parses libucl and outputs stuff in libexo and it forks itself into creating a jail in, in the most stupid way possible. But it's, it's a POC. Uh, I would love to hear how that if, if the same approach can be replicated in Beehive as well. So if we can have alternative front ends of Beehive based on people's needs. So there's uh, definitely the Rust front end from Patrick and he's been very busy with that, although he probably won't be on today's call. Uh, so let's get our kind of questions lined up for him. The and... next week call is much more likely to catch him. Correct. Yeah. Um, the question makes little sense because Beehive has lots of logic, really most of the logic in the user space daemon. So Beehive as a type 2 hypervisor has a part implemented in the host kernel, for example, FreeBSD or Solaris, which generally exposes a pseudo device used by the user space daemon to get to basically run the guest threads. And whenever the guest threads need software support, because the hardware virtualization can't uh, cover this case, then via the uh, pseudo device, the request is forwarded to the daemon, the daemon handles it, either fixes up the state and lets it continue running or aborts the guest, basically. Uh, or it does something on behalf of the guest, for example, perform IO uh, on some pseudo device, uh, on some virtual device. Yeah. So the, it's not that Beehive is some pure kernel functionality to be con uh, figured by user space. It really runs as a demon. So, so just for, for me to understand so this, no, the beehive command is actually a demon. That's what you're yes. saying. Right? It's it, a yeah. long running process. Uh -huh. It doesn't yes. demonize itself, but it's a yeah. long running process. And it's the companion for the guest for its whole lifetime. Uh -huh. The VMN device can outlive the process if you want to basically halt the guest. Mm -hmm. uh, without destroying its state. So let's say you have a system which has crashed and you want to inspect the crashed guest there, then you would leave the device around. Mm -hmm. There are helper tools like Beehive Control to modify this device. For example, read or write virtual registers. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the daemon contains a lot of logic. It has its own event loop to handle things like for example, a completion of I.O. Uh, or failures of I.O. Um, requests from the guest and so on. Understood. Okay. That, That's that a totally different yeah. uh, beast from the point of view. Okay. True, and, but and, that and... suggests uh, Patrick is rewriting device emulation. Uh, if you 
we, if you inter so what can be done is take the uh, VMM device, so the kernel support, and write your own uh, daemon on top of it, your, uh, which I think has been attempted in Rust. And this is where one of those very small uh, hypervisors for unikernels uh, is looking into things. And basically we write all of this user-based code in Rust to get supposedly more speed, but uh, at the very least uh, less bugs for a rewrite. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can we can we get a, a a link to that Rust thing if it is available? It's in their um, repo, indeed. Uh, Oxide Computing repo, I believe. Oh, okay, okay, understood. Thank you. Possibly Patrick's private. It's it's in the uh, minutes, this, but there. Are that's not the one I was thinking of about. Go ahead. Didn't Intel have some experiment or something? The Acorn hypervisor, perhaps. Oh yes, that sounds about right. Yeah, that is sort of kind of beehive, but they don't acknowledge that very aggressively. Thank you for that schedule, Corvin. I'll drop that in the minutes. Um, so um, let's see, any other discussions along those lines? Concerns, questions, um, and you mentioned that the uh, Beehive process is a long-running sort of not quite a daemon, but the uh, questions come up of like, okay, so how do we see what the basic facts of a running VM are? Is there a need for, say, a state machine that would either be an expansion of the user space Beehive or something um, in addition to it that sort of gradually elegantly there are already joins it multiple state machines inside of the daemon okay and inside the kernel for example for vitio uh, uh scuzzy you have the scuzzy state machines okay cool uh, and that's how things work um what's missing is uh, again this at least in freebsd maybe uh solaris device if um beehive Folks have a better story in that regard, but in FreeBC, what's missing is the uh, flexible and dynamic enough uh, service management. So the RC.d scripts aren't expressive enough to do all of the stuff uh, you want to do around the lifetime of a virtual machine. Create, which is similar to VNet enabled jails, where you want to have an ePair interface or a TAP interface uh, to be added to bridges um, or other overlay networks to hook up the virtualized uh, execution environment, whether a Beehive guest or a VNet enabled jail or a zone to your host network stack. And doing it in shell scripts isn't really uh, ideal. <laughs> ideal, yes. <laughs> I wanted to avoid getting uh, rather um, more vulgar. Um, on the like I said, I, I've said this before, like like on on the on the OS side, typically, uh, what we what we do for for creating a whole interface, is we we just kind of use a zone interface as a as a front end for it. Um, can you describe how operationally that is used? Um, I mean, so how does it, it? How is it attached to the physical network? How is it encapsulated or not? The specifics for how it's written is something you probably need to ask like Andy or but how is it used? one of those guys. But I mean, I know a week or two ago, I had uploaded an example of a, of a config that I'd sanitized. Mm -hmm. um, but basically within the zone config, 
there's a net section that includes what the, what what device what actual physical device you're you're attaching to as well as what you're able to um let's see for beehive so for example what a such a network interface be just an additional MAC address on your physical network card with full access to the uh, physical network? A, is it a VLAN? It's a full, it's a first, Can it be it's encapsulated a, via VXLAN or other overlays? It's a it's a fully yeah. In our world, it's a it's a fully considered VN, uh, fully considered VNIC. Okay. So, so Crossbow strikes again. Yeah, Crossbow is my friend. <laughs> Understood, and Intranig had to drop off. Uh, shifting gears, Daniel, I know you're a busy boy. Do you have any news to report from your production use? And that no, might segue not, into the next question. Go ahead. Yeah, not too much. Um, just, uh, you know, 13.2 came out. So um, some new machines and some dev machines. I've upgraded to play around with the... Uh, the greater than 16 CPU or vCPU um, option that we have now. Yes, sir. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess philosophically, I'm, I'm curious about like, it, there, there are some concerns of like, the more CPUs you pack into a single VM, uh, there's, there's certain quality of diminishing returns, if I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about that. And then I'm also curious if there's on any other 13.2 uh, release features that I should be um, looking looking out for and, uh, and, and testing before I uh, move all the way into production with that. And I think everybody on this call uses current or not FreeBSD except for me. I'm, I'm, I always stick to the release path because I'm extra, uh, extra paranoid, but um, uh, yeah, any any other thirteen two features I should be digging into? Um, you may want to experiment with VitIO input. Tell us more. You can pass through a dev input event device, like a keyboard and mouse device, to at least Linux guests. I don't know if uh, we have FreeBSD drivers for that uh, on All the right. guest side. But for example, you could uh, take your laptop and pass through your uh, touchpad Linux. to a guest. Uh, yeah, but Linux doesn't work. Only Windows works. Ooh, no, only, only Windows, Windows works. works. Right. Yes, because Linux requires uh, Vita O 1.0 or 1.2. I'm not sure. And uh, Beehive only supports Vita O 0 0.9. OK. And this will only work for that... input devices. And, and it's, the it's name. just this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you never know. There's there could be some magic. Uh, you get get some bits in interesting ways back and forth. But uh, so all right, that sounds that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll play with that for sure. It's the features. next best thing for human interface devices before we get for USB pass through. <laughs> right, right now we have to give it the whole card. Exactly. Right now you have to pass through it on the PCI level. And if you don't have enough well behaving USB host uh, devices, you can't do that. Do you but, know who added that? Uh, I posted the commit message. Oh, thank you. And I, I'm not seeing a manual page, but- It's from Corvin. Got it, of course. Thank you, Corvin. <laughs> and in that case, it makes sense business. that they tested uh, primarily with uh, Windows. Uh -huh. But uh, their use case, um, as I've said in this talk before, is providing a native feeling Windows guest oh, so that they can have a free BSD hypervisor handle the the industrial applications underneath and run a Windows guest which feels like it's running natively as the graphical user interface. Yep. 
for legacy applications and so on. And thank you for updating the manual pages. I see it's in just Beehive and Beehive config. Good work. That might be a good experiment. I have a, I have a home sort of backup server box, uh, you know, that runs uh, Windows Windows VMs, and I could, you know, pass through pass through a few pieces and you know make it a functional uh, Windows box with the GPU and input output and all that stuff. I have not yet um, tested if the uh, fixes. Uh, to that I was SCSI made it uh, in an MFC. So if we- As I recall, it can't because of the jump from 32-bit oh, right. to 64-bit. Right, he intentionally uh, did can't a lot more done. than I asked for and, <laughs> and, <the laughs> and future-proofed uh, CAM by extending the tag size to 64-bit and that can't be backported without breaking the ABI. And Correct. Uh, in acceptable ways. Uh, can anyone else name new features that landed? Don't be shy, Corvin, if you're responsible for those nifty new features. I'm not Has aware any... of any features yet. Okay. Has anyone uh, plotted the boot time versus vCPU account in yeah, 13.2? So Daniel, that's been on everyone's kind of to-do list, but my lab hasn't had a network cable to it such that it would be just very nice to, to take a high CPU count machine and boot a VM with one vCPU, maybe immediately terminate it, then two, then three, then four, and just step up and just see what that ramp up time is. Cause there are some concerns that it might get a bit slow to iterate over all the vCPUs and get going. And so a simple it test, but it just be... has to happen. <laughs> Because uh, one of my worries is that it used to be that uh, it, in the early uh, high VCPU uh, versions, uh, the uh, unlaunched application processors were just spinning at 100%. So while in the bootloader, you would see a short peak uh, in all the VCPU threads to uh, accept the first one to 100% well, until the kernel uh, really launched them, the guest kernel that is. Well, I certainly have some, um, some servers that, uh, that are available for anyone's experimentation if you need it. Um, I, have, I have two decently high CPU boxes that are, that are idle with no production stuff on them and that could be true for you know at least the next five minutes uh that said uh i'll move well the ones in question are moved to 13.2 and how many vcpus are we or host threads are we talking about uh well there's that uh that uh box um there, there's uh, that box that i uh we sent to fremont um that I just, I had client systems on it. I just moved them off. So that is clean as a whistle, except for, you know, except for PF, nothing else is running on it. So that's got 56 threads. Um, and then I've got a, I've got an Epic and I've got another, then I've got another Xeon just like that. So okay, that's definitely so adequate to run a test. Yeah. Very nice. Speaking of cool hardware, Brian, did you get further with your new system? Unfortunately not, still uh, lots of medical stuff going on, so. I hear you, I hope that's going smoothly and positively. Yeah, we're getting there. It's just a long trip back and forth to Stanford, so. Oh boy. We'll see. Good. Godspeed. Thank you. Goran, you are poised to say something. How are you, and do you have something to report? Well, it was uh, Orthodox Easter, so I was only eating. <laughs> <laughs> but the the idea is to... <clears throat> I talked to Shogbo about the Envy list, and I want to extend them with uh, Float, maybe later with something else, but I want to get my hands dirty with the Float first. Uh, the idea is... <clears throat> 
probably for Beehive or any existing application, it's not such a plus. But I would like to have in base uh, UCL to NV and NV to UCL and uh, emitting with EXO. Uh, so ideally that when a new project is started, uh, it can utilize most of the, how to say, well, util functions. Utilize the util, that, that's a good one. Uh, but in any case, uh, if we start a FreeBSD project now, it's probably very good to to, be, to make Envy list uh, the base of uh, knowledge and communication. So I'd like to make Envy lists and UCL types compatible uh with the rest of the types that are missing being signed integers and uh and date or time was it from the ucl so, i so, think we um, can... uh, just i a looked second. into how that it's encoded and by default it encodes time durations as floating point values in seconds they might get two for one so uh there's yeah, a yeah. special well, type. Uh, there is an, you, you can tell UCL to treat dates as strings. So we can yes. kind of get by. Uh, and uh, with the signness of the integers, any application knows what it costed the their value to, to or from. Uh, Storing it in Envy list and storing it, restoring it back from Envy list uh, knows to cast into whatever it needs. But <clears throat> if I want to create uh, a middle for Envy list using XO, I gotta know the sign. It's it's not saved with the Envy list, so that would also be nice. And that way we would have emitters for whatever EXO is supporting. And ideally we would have the converters uh, being, let's take a jail as an example. It has a custom configuration format, but if we load that into Envy list, it can be easily converted to UCL, well, will be one day and uh, uh, UCL knows how to emit its own uh, configuration. So ideally what I'm working on will be uh, converting um, custom formats into UCL. But for now, it's adding float to the Envy list. What's also not preserved is the size of integer types in libmv so right now libmv has only a pointer sized uh, on all implementations at least uh, unsigned integer type which is what 95% uh, of kernel development cares about and they, of course you can cast any other uh, reasonable integer like type into this type and cast it back on the other end but that assumes that both sides know the a schema and if you want to pass UCL, convert it to uh, via libmv and send it to another process and then emit it out again and get something reasonable, um, then you need to preserve the types as passed out of the config file and not just the information uh, captured by the schema because there is no schema in that generic case. I agree, uh, but for for the beginning, because it's going to be my first um, fiddling with Envy list code, uh, I will just concentrate on the float and learn more about the inner workings of Envy list. In the meantime, I learned that there's... Uh, implementation of 
Envy list that ZFS is carrying around, probably because it wants to, to be consistent over operating systems, but it works differently than, than the one in the base. And from a review perspective, to add that one feature will get it far faster reviewed rather than here's my epic patch to cover every new type you'd ever want. And mm -hmm. I, have, I have several sub subtle issues and it will never get it accepted. So focusing on that is fantastic. Uh, welcome, Mohammed. Actually, there was, I read the mail thread from 2013 about the uh, about when Envy list was added. And back then we had every integer possible. I will get you that link in just Please a second. Please do, that sounds great. Thank you, you've read uh, my mind. Have your links ready, good work. Yeah. And uh, um, it was reduced over time because the API was ridiculous. Uh, meaning it has anything from 8 to 64-bit integers signed and unsigned and probably something else. So the, it was a huge API that, well, converged towards, yeah, converged towards uh, what we have now. And probably if you're not doing something generic, the envy list right now is perfect because float is 64 bit. You can store it in a unsigned integer that is 64 bit long. It's just really clumsy. And what about the NDNS between the different machines and so on? So probably what, what was the reason that float didn't get into the, the envy list in the beginning was that it's not, I think it's not the same on all machines, but I will have to, to check that and how the uh, NDNS works and how float works. Is it always the IEE, whatever number, uh, the implementation or the, there are some quirky corners of the float that I'm not aware of. Okay, do you recall who initiated that discussion in 2013? Or that'll be answered when you find the link. Uh, so I'm doing a quick search, but can't find it. I have, uh, come on, I know I had it around. Okay. I will dig it up. Uh, okay, I know excellent. I have, you know. Great. Um, that is exciting. So, uh, let's see, Mohammed, you have just joined. I know you want to be a fly on the wall, but I would love to know your interests relating to Beehive. Hello. Uh, Hello. Honestly, it, it's more personal interest for, for, for myself because I currently have like most of the people who still like Unix, uh, not Linux, but not really using BSD uh, system on daily basis yet, I'm using macOS. I had a chance to play a bit, a bit or get introduced to XHive, which is basically re-implementation of Beehive based on the uh, macOS, what they call uh, hypervisor kit or something like this. Yep, as a front end. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for now, it's just mainly for, for personal interest, to be honest. No okay. business need or and I'm not running any uh, production workload on them. No worries. Um, Andrew, loyal attendee, do you have any news from your shop? Not really. I'm just kind of listening in. Amen. And Jan, you commented. Envyless thread. Hello. Good work. Thank you. Oh, don't bury the lead on that. Uh, from PJD, he also gave that talk at the OpenZFS Developer Summit saying how we fell in love with Envyless. So that is great to hear. Um, let me make a list. B -b -b mailing list thread. Boom. I'll put that in the minutes.
Yeah, that's exactly who you want to be interested in such a thing. Cool. Thank you for that link. <clears throat> And I'm uh, just like OpenZFS having its own internal library. I wonder if he has his own internal, internal library for their product. And sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. Okay, I trust his code. If you use ZFS on FreeBSD, you trust his work. Let's see, going down the list. Um, other hot topics, uh, Jan, you always have insightful observations. Do Are any pounding at the front of your head to share with the group or that um, you want feedback on? Because that's one of the best uses of these groups is that you have some informed users. Go ahead. Uh, let me quickly check the lib uh, UCL object uh, type definition in the okay. API. Uh, because um, the object, because I don't think that you need the integer type, UCL int. So they don't have different integer type sizes. They only have a signed integer type, unless you over, uh, what is this? Okay. So there's only one uh, integer type there. And it's probably the largest reasonable signed integer type. Oh. Yeah, it's yeah. a union of a 64-bit signed integer, a pointer to a character, a double, and so on. So if we only want to preserve what lib, uh, UCL gives us it would be enough to add a 64 bit floating point and assigned integer types, which wouldn't uh, cause a vast API explosion. So, only adding if the tag bits are still there in the structures, it should be quite straightforward to add. Okay. Um, Please uh, don't repeat the mistake I've seen in before. <laughs> it's a neat uh, binary encoding used and they decided to uh, put the sign into the type so that they have a 64 bit uh, positive integer type and a 64 bit negative, which effectively gives them a signed 65 bit integer type, which no CPU or a uh, programming language can represent <laughs> properly, which is uh, just annoying to deal with. You have to implement those protocols. Hmm. So that is an interesting choice. Yeah, they, <laughs> exactly. They, uh, they, the reason for it, they wanted to keep it concise. And so because they use a variable length encoding by they avoided the supposed complexity of uh, protocol buffers and similar protocols with the zigzag encoding of sign and unsigned integers where you interleave them so that you can put them close together in the lower uh, code range and have uh, basically that the size of an integer uh, a value is about proportional to the logarithm of its uh, absolute value. And, but by doing it, this, they uh, they avoided this because now it's the type and the type is tiny, is only a few bits. But the downside is that at the upper end, you get all of this complexity of dealing with 64 plus one bit fixed sized integers. Hmm. or at the very least uh, detecting them, discarding them, it's out of range. So you get an additional overflow condition. <laughs> I have a pop quiz question inspired by the jail call, which is if you had a lovely virtual machine 
repo to draw from that you trust, would you prefer have a package you install that represents a a uh, Nextcloud VM or a ZFS send stream or a just raw tarball that you handle manually or something else entirely? So for example, Andrew, if you found a useful VM, uh, are you hand rolling that in every case or what would the problem oh, no. look like? Of course, no, that would be horrible. <laughs> So I know your vagrant work from uh, Mark, was it? Probably addresses some of that, but what would the easy button look like? I mean, I don't know Mark's opinion about it, but my easy button look, <laughs> generally looks like a uh, not an NFS stream, or uh, I'm sorry, a ZFS stream. Well, Just because I use them all over the place. Virtual machine images are a special case in that they are very large compared to almost all other software and often very sparse if correctly encoded. But a naive uh, decompressed representation of them can be prohibitively large. So you don't want them polluting your var cache uh, PKG with the last few dozen versions of each image. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, installing them and having some kind of post-install script register them with my Beehive runtime would be very nice to have. Uh, in that case, we would have to make sure that there's an acceptable multi-repo uh, integration level where basically these uh, images, you can add this repository of images and it won't interfere with your normal packages because they are trusted to only install to non-overlapping paths or whatever so that there will be no conflicts between them. Uh, in that case, just having them one package install array would be very nice, but uh, that would be FreeBSD specific. Well, what if the... What if there's, if we were to trust, key point trust, something like, uh, what is it? Uh, the, I forget the name of Linux appliance market, but what if like a port, we had the additional Beehive specific elements just in a package and we say, pull the VM over from, it's kind of the tip of my tongue. Uh, what is it? I'm spacing it, but hopefully you know what I mean. In a way, you're describing something like Ansible Galaxy. Fair <laughs> enough. Bailey, an instruction to fetch some blob somewhere, patch it, and uh, consume it. Yep. Um. Technical depth as a service. <laughs> there you go. Other opinions, thoughts, concerns? I had some experience with the, well, I experimented with having absolutely zero uh, infrastructure for a project that I built called Reggae and it's, a, it's basically a jail manager and has something to do with a beehive a little bit. And um, I realized that if I have um, machine that, a virtual machine that is like a vanilla ideally with zfs i prefer the ansible or whatever uh, text-based solution over image one now i didn't i don't think we can find a provisioner that's that's gonna be up to everyone's taste but okay. uh, uh, I think having at least the virtual machine with the FreeBSD and ZFS would would be a great start. Maybe um, something official on the Vagrant, maybe something that resembles current download FreeBSD org that well, you can grab. There are the VM images in raw, VHD, and VMDK, VMDK format. So there's that for what it's worth. 
I think none of them is uh, ZFS installed, but I didn't use them in a while. So you, I'm glad you mentioned that. There is now makefs-tzfs, and I've been experimenting with that in 14. And yes, you can blast out a root on ZFS thanks to, thanks to Mark uh, Johnson's work, uh, root on ZFS VM, and it's quite promising. And even an unprivileged user can do that. So I'm happy. Um, what would be uh, probably good to have free, uh, Beehive's adoption uh, is a, a collection of basically working installers of VM images for all the common enough uh, guest operating systems so that you don't have to figure out how to get this uh, Linux distribution of this uh, Windows version installed just a clear documentation or even better ready to use image uh, raw file image um, of take this uh, and it will boot either in the installer and in, or in a vm image i would prefer an installer but i understand that others feel different about that um <sighs> Because that's uh, often annoying, uh, for example, having to deal with some bootloader issue when some distribution includes unusual grub configurations or something. Oh, I mean, for Linux, that's probably reasonable. For Windows, it's probably not for licensing reasons. For Windows, it's still possible to document Oh yeah, you Especially can document it, sure. <laughs> document it and automate it. Basically, download this, follow this link, uh, click the annoying dialog. Once you have the ISO, run this script. Enter your it. license key here. <laughs> you no longer need a license key to install. Fair enough. You only need it within a few, to be compliant within a certain time frame. So it wouldn't be uh, risky uh, That's good. to document how to install Windows Server 2000 something uh, via the Beehive command line without uh, any VNC whatsoever. Uh, with RDP enabled uh, and uh, a password you had to insert into the uh, script so that it comes up and you have a well-known admin user which can log in via RDP and it's just accessible out of the box. We are the first vitionic or whatever mm -hmm. that works for Windows rather than having to figure out how to slowly uh, add the right drivers and do I really need the VNC server anymore or is RDP enough? Right, so, right. Yeah, cool. that would be nice to see because it would uh, lower the barrier to entry. These annoying things where you come into a call like this and someone will tell you, yeah, of course you have to do this, 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 and this. And any reasonable new uh, user is just <laughs> baffled uh, and gives up after a while. It's a pretty high bar of entry. Where admit. you get these uh, beehive managers, um, which uh, include such things, but having this not front end specific would be useful. Okay. We are approaching an hour. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas, concerns, funny jokes, horror stories? Well, the other thing I'd kind of like to mention with the, the whole idea of, the, of, of having an ecosystem like that is to bear in mind that once you have an image down for something that you may want to make multiple VMs based on, at that point, cloning looks good because then you're not duplicating information. Um, I would heavily recommend against doing that. Do tell. Because uh, if you, uh, so the, 
ZFS Snapshotting and Cloning for uh, virtual machines looks tempting at the beginning and it gets ever worse over time. You have a hole which only gets deeper. Uh, at some point, the differences between the images will be larger than what they used to share. And you have all of this uh, metadata which can't be released to the old version. And the other problem I've found is that if you snapshot the pre-configured image and then clone it, uh, snapshot it and clone it, and after what you want to move the guest from one host to another, now you drag the um, you have to bring the base additional with data you. set with it. Now you want to move or you can the other it. instance of it. Oh shit! This data set already exists. How do I deduplicate this again on the receiving end? Well, and if you have, there, that, there are ways to deal with that. I mean, yes, it's I've, all... I've done them. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, given the size of virtual machines, most of the time compared to the data that a reasonable virtual machine uh, worth deduplicating because you run enough instances of it is supposed to manage, the operating system just disappears as overhead. And I found it a lot better to, yes, keep my collection of pre-created snapshot um, ZFS um, volumes, but to just duplicate them to instantiate a virtual machine because just duplicating uh, with ZFS send uh, pipe some buffering support in user land and like um, M buffer or something, and then write it out again at several gigabytes a second is so fast that it's just not worth dragging all of these dependencies around. I trust there are perfect use cases and terrible use cases. So don't rule it out, but No, no, hey. <laughs> it's just that it looks so tempting and elegant at the beginning, but it gets, uh, let's say you have your Windows 2000 something uh, virtual machines, and then you uh, install a new service pack and suddenly the uh, shared files are all overwritten. <laughs> each guest and yep. the, there is no saving anymore. Fair That's enough. great well, yep. for uh, for immutable infrastructure. If you really follow this paradigm, that's the tool, a good tool to do it. But as soon as you treat them as generic long-lived machines, which someone else manages and not every... And well, not, then it's someone else's this problem. Is the platform and the platform team manages all of this and wipes the system. Yep. Yes, thank you. But hey, uh, that's up to the administrator. There might be absolutely perfect use cases. So embrace course, them, share them, but... blog them, and, and clearly document when not to do this. Because yes, you can paint yourself into a corner and you're giving me flashbacks to that moment that people thought, hey, let's just put all our VM properties in ZFS properties. And they found that, uh-oh, that's an administrative operation and changing this one parameter on one VM halts all ZFS operations to complete them uh, atomically. And that was burning people. So anyway. It's still uh, the case where it's a it serializing operation to update a single data set property? Um, not uh, and the custom properties for whatever reason. Okay. So they were considered administrative. So you could name a whole bunch of things, but people went wild cramming everything into ZFS, which is not the best uh, database mm -hmm. out there. Anyway, which it's not intended to be exactly. No. Uh, what was his name, Mark? But uh, something else uh, to consider in these cases is really uh, to make sure you find out uh, the right block sizes and alignment for your guest file system. And then to uh, think hard about uh, enabling block level DDoP on your file systems, because that can be rebased. Only that, um, that being said, did they ever share the iSCSI NFS and ZFS? Yes, you uh, shared your uh, very useful 
uh, right among, but there was one case where I think you may have uh, read your article where you may have measured the network because the size you uh, reported in your article was like 1.5 kilobytes over the, and that just aligns too well with uh, the, uh, the Ethernet MTU instead of uh, common block sizes. So I'm afraid at one point you may have measured the packet payload size and not the block size. Is there an article to be shared? There is a link. Getting to it. Give me a sec. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> because the TCP MSS size would, or the Ethernet frame size would make a lot more sense, but you captured that for the results. Do you have something written on the relationship of block sizes to Ethernet frames? A treatise? Mm -hmm. No, um, and it shouldn't really matter because you can't. The problem is that it, no disk has, I know, uses 1.5 kilobyte blocks and no file system uses them because right. it would be, I don't won't rule out that IBM has done this in the past, but. Uh, oh, and if I remember correctly, one of the graphs showed that there were some one point, oh, just about 1.5 kilobyte uh, block transfers. Okay, here it is. And Thank if you, you really want to read it, because our... Hmm. I did want to read it because uh, yeah, I the know, detrace scripts are very the, useful. If you read the, the blog post, it lost yeah. the formatting. So there's at yeah. the bottom, there's a link to the Word document that actually works. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see okay. uh, the last distribution is uh, there, down there. Oh, okay. So I misremembered. But so you have two kilobytes and five, uh, almost half a kilobyte, not one kilobyte. Okay. And, but up there you have the uh, 1537, which is, yeah, that's the size you get at the... Uh, networking layer, what you're tracing there aren't the blocks, but the uh, buffers of SCSI requests as they move through the TCP stack. At this point, uh, I mean, not at this It's fragmented at that point. When I was writing it, it was more like whenever I was reading something about D-Trace, here you are this probe and it works perfectly. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know how they got to it. So yeah. the most of this article is how do you even navigate through the code and detrace all together and how do you glue it together? So it was yes. my task at the company, that, hence the company link, mm -hmm. sorry about that, uh, to, to find a correlation between block sizes of ZFS, iSCSI, and NFS. So mm -hmm. that was the the how to say, the problem I used to learn the D-Trace. And it's a really good idea to use D-Trace to find out what your VMs are doing, what your storage is doing on behalf of your VMs and to learn the alignment of things. I mean, but for iSCSI the... and NFS, maybe you could even get by with Wireshark. But NFS, from a D-Trace point of view, D, uh, NFS mm -hmm. and ZFS are beautifully written. They mm -hmm. are really easy to get the, the info. iSCSI, it took me almost all the time I needed. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent on that ticket to, to figure out the iSCSI. So on, uh, don't really hold me accountable on the iSCSI parts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the thing is that uh, you've probably, it looks like you missed because the documentation is only reference documentation, uh, the CTL admin uh, interface, which uh, can also give you uh, the load on the exposed targets. So CTL admin. 
Anyway, well, thank you. That is a perfect point to end on. I will read that. That is just talk, like talk dirty to me. <laughs> Fantastic work, Goran. Thank and uh, thank you all. I will hang around a few minutes and keep up the good work. I very much look forward, look forward to that NV to uh, UCL and back. So everything you explore there is useful. Anyway, thanks, gang. I'm going to call it at uh, 10.02 Pacific and uh, talk to some of you next week. And I wish you a great weekend. Bye-bye. Take care.